And then sediment delivery is the other part of this is we have erosion, we can calculate sediment yield. Where is that sediment getting to? And is it having a beneficial or a negative impact? And so delivery is something we want to be thinking about managing uh, for and against, depending on what's happening and where it's happening in the watershed. So hopefully that helps you a little bit with terms um, and some of the things you'll hear today. Um, I'll just pause for a minute, kind of test you, give you a chance to look at this pretty graph. What, what do you think you're looking at? Rainfall over different years. Close. What's the extension of rainfall downstream? Stream flow. Stream flow. So here it's popping up for you. I just let it populate. This is down near Kernville from 1939 to 2015. 76, 77. Mm -hmm. 85. Yes. Um, kind of relive history a little bit. Think about that. So this lets me just kind of, we're going to talk a little bit about what makes stream flow and what are the things going on up of watershed um, that drive it. But just appreciate this interannual variability, different seasons. We've just come out of a drought. Some, some are saying we're not going to get out of it this year. Um, so you can see the, the low flows here. And that's just a, another way just to really zero in. This is that, that 84, 85, and then 80, 85, 86 year. Just to, we can have a really dry year and a really wet year, right? And we know that. Um, all this data is off of USGS's mapper site. So you guys see you know, lots of different gauges. There's also what's called the California Data uh, Exchange Center. Lots of places you can get this kind of data if you want. And we can make I think, these links available to you later. So just wanted you to know that's where this information came from. Question? Yeah, please. And stop me any time. We'll manage time accordingly. The scale on the graph said mean cubic feet per second. Is, what is that average, the mean or the average? Is it over the year? Or is These it, are daily values. Daily values. So you're seeing a daily mean, right? Good. So they're Sorry. measuring. Thank you. Sorry. Does that help you? Sorry, I should have yeah. made that clear. Thank you for asking. I mean, you can. You can measure and present stream flow in a lot of different units, but generally it's, it's a daily cubic feet per second, which is kind of an, an odd way to say it. Um, of course, you know what a watershed is. You've got a lovely map up here of the Mark West Creek watershed. I just want you to kind of, the concept that a watershed collects, stores, and releases water. How does, how does that rainfall, that precipitation, come onto the watershed? How is it stored? Sometimes in our ponds, in soil, in geology. And then how's that water released? Because that's where we have an influence on what's happening for erosion. So just be thinking about that. The, the collection, the storage, and the release. Another way to look at this, and I just put these out there. Um, more complexly, we get rainfall and precipitation, and the watershed collects it, but it, fl it flows through our plants, through our, our trees and our canopy across our rooftops, as, as some of our questions hinted at. Um, and then moves down through the, the soil, maybe on the surface and maybe through the soil. I'll talk a little bit about that. Plants are using it, and there's evaporation and evapotranspiration. So overland flow, different kinds of flow, and the ways in which that rainfall eventually gets to the stream or not. What, what and is it? Into a body. Go ahead. What does interception mean? Um, yeah, good. So, this is a, just a diagram to interpret, you know, the cycle, the hydrologic cycle, but it's just a way to then go out in the watershed and think, how does a canopy intercept rainfall? And, and there's different numbers for different kinds of plants and trees, but, but these trees are sometimes taking in as much as 10, 20, redwoods sometimes 30% before that rainfall even gets to the ground and plants <laughs> taking it in. That's interception. So the water budget can be really affected by the type of vegetation you have. And then they transpire it back out into the air and it cycles back right, right. again. Right, right. So it doesn't, it doesn't never get... It doesn't, the yeah. So, so a portion of that water budget gets taken up by the plant before it ever gets into the soil and ever makes it to the stream. But, it, but it, then it goes back to sure. the beginning of the, of yeah. the cycle and right. starts over again. Yeah. Right, so we can come back and you can just envision the paths, the routes. It's much more complex than rain hits the ground and gets to the creek, right? That's the point I'd like you to take away from today. So the big canopy, the big oaks, down to the leaf itself, you know, during the rainstorm, they're actually taking in rainfall. You, might, you always think about the stomata giving it off, but there's, there's some moisture going back into the tree during storms. And grasses have um, intercept as well, lower amounts. 
Um, and all that then leads to the stream flow. So that's just, you know, that hydrologic cycle, that diagram, is a, is a, gives you kind of a technical look at what these three photos share with you. As the rain comes, it falls through our vegetation and makes it through the soil and geology to make stream flow. Um, an important factor then is just, you know, we get to experience the seasonality of our watersheds. And um, we've got these beautiful yellows and golds and browns of our, our summer and our fall. And currently, right now, we're enjoying the green, that velvet color. Uh, when, when everything's greening up and the soils are wet. Um, and we share this kind of dynamic, and again, I'm going to say some things you all already know, but we share this dry, hot summer and these, these moist, wet winters known as the Mediterranean climate with lots of places around the world. Generally, uh, continental margins that face west and that are somewhere between 30 and 45 degrees south and, and north. Um, and so pretty unique situation. Um, and they all have that same kind of pattern over the winter and the summer. Really wet in the winter and dry in the summer. The other thing about Mediterranean climates, and this is a map to kind of reinforce this, is um, we have incredible variability in our annual rainfall. You saw that in, this, in the, that stream gauge for the Russian River, where one year is dry, one year is wet. This is a map showing you that between years, the variability of annual precipitation with it being really low in the east, and as you move west and into California and the southwest, really high. Where does a lot of our water policy, climate kind of perspective come from, from the east? Well, they, they can almost count on the same amount of rainfall next year as what happened this year and what happened last year. Out in the west, much, much different. That's a debate that's been raging for a long time, from John Wesley Powell to others, um, that, that the West's water policy needs to be different because of that variability. But, so just appreciate that. Mediterranean climates, arid climates, have this variability where other kinds of climates don't. So we talked about precipitation a little and the climate. Um, of course, climate and weather. Everybody comfortable with those two words, the difference? Climate's kind of what's the pattern over a long time. Whether it's what's happening today or tomorrow or, or, or yesterday. Um, and, and I say that about weather because another part of our complexity is, is really how El Nino and the other forces work to bring rain to California and bring rain to the Pacific Coast. And really bring it in what's being termed now, as we used to call them pineapple expresses, I think we still do. But now, uh, uh, for climate reasons and for weather uh, science reasons, being called atmospheric rivers. This is uh, February uh, 2014. I, I talked to somebody, we talked a little bit about that earlier this morning. If you remember those storms, that we can really get a lot of rain come on to the California coast and at very specific locations. Um, and I think you all probably, you know, appreciate that um, from last year and the last two years. The rest of the state really suffered, right? But we had a couple different storms come in that really filled our, our water ponds and other things. We kind of got through okay relative to the rest of the state. We still had a dry year, of course, and we're still in drought. But that's because of these types of rivers. Where the, where the moisture comes on to the continental margin can drive your stream flow and can really bring intense storms and drive erosion. What, what's the unit there? What is that? Um, this is centimeters of water. Okay. Yeah. Just so you can see that. And you've got, um, you know, plus or minus the bay right there. So it just gives you context. Um, for Marin County, I'm trying to remember which storm it was, the 7th and 8th, 9th of February. Um, all through that county, we had somewhere between 6 and 8 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. You went up on Mount Tan, and you were up over 18 inches of rain because one of these rivers just really went right over Marin. So the climate and the variability in the weather patterns can really drive what's happening for stream flow and that, that hydrologic process. The landscape and the geology, of course, have an influence. And so you want to be thinking about that. And I'll just start at a big, big scale and talk about California. And it's a moment to take pause in those the foresters in the room, those of you that manage vegetation. I think it's important to point out that what we see today isn't necessarily what was here before. And I don't mean just yesterday, I mean 50 years ago, I mean 300 million years ago, 
the Sierras start to get formed. 150 million years ago, we start to get the coastal range. And we do forest transition and transition over hundreds of years, right? And so what we think we see today, we think, oh, it's always been this way. Well, we probably want to check that assumption and, and realize that things have changed over different time scales. You ever think about the Russian River in that context? Why does it make that turn and head out to the ocean? And then, you know, of course, we've got the Petaluma River here. About, you know, some debate, but somewhere 50 million to 10 million years ago, there was a, some faulting in what they call the, the Washu anticline. It's, a, it's some sediment, layers of sediment that, that folded. It actually created uplift and forced the river out. Mm -hmm. So the Russian River hasn't always gone out to where it goes now to generate. So be thinking about that. So erosion happens. Our landscape gets shaped and formed by these forces, by the weather, by geology, um, by the faulting. Um, we drill it even further. So here's the Bay Area. We kind of move up into Ronan's, or, uh, Ronan's Rill. And uh, we've got these different kinds of uh, volcanics that probably are fairly new, uh, the Mayakamas and others. And you guys know that probably better than I do. They haven't always been here either, these, these mountains. So. Keep that in mind. Of course, and these are all the fault lines, right, running parallel that you all know about as well. They, they direct where streams flow and create the, the weaknesses in the rock for erosion to, to, to wear down and create streams and, and watersheds. So I've talked climate a little. I've talked weather, a little bit about geology and the time scale. And all that meant also we need to talk a little bit about soils um, and how the rain falls and hits the soil and works through. So that's, this gives us a chance to talk about kind of that surface flow versus subsurface flow. Um, soils can have really good structure um, that allows water to really infiltrate. You may not see this as well. Hopefully you can see that difference, how broken up and into different um, um, class and, and pot, um, dirt clods these are. Um, with lots of root going down through. Here you don't see that same kind of structure. Uh, this is really impact or compacted soil. Uh, it's not going to let a lot of water work its way down through. Um, so we, we get less infiltration, we get more surface flow. Soils also have a different amount of storage. The depth to bedrock can be different and, and it depends on when that, when that soil profile is saturated as to whether you get overland flow or not. So that's always happening. That's always a very dynamic process. Um, you can get a big storm, but your soil isn't saturated yet, so it can take it all in. Your soil can be saturated, and you can get a little storm, and you get surface runoff. So you, you've got to be just paying attention to when and where the soil is saturated, and which storms come and, and generate the surface flow. I'm going to skip that one because I want to make sure we do just in time. And this is just a, a place to just reemphasize the depth to bedrock. Some soils are very shallow on top of the bedrock, and some are for a number of, of feet even. And so they have the ability to store a lot more water uh, and not, not really contribute any kind of surface runoff, but always store that water and route it subsurface to the creek. So I'll pass one paper around. I didn't bring copies because I just figured um, we can send the electronic versions to everybody. Um, this kind of then just gets me to a, a, a start of wrapping up that for a lot of our oak woodlands and the soils and the ways in which stream flow is generated, we usually see the majority come from down below the surface. And this paper explains this graph really well. Um, and I'll just pass it around. You guys can visit with it. We can talk about it in the field or during a break. But we have a soil layer typically in these oak woodland soils that's really rich in clay. So you see the symbol BT. Whenever you see that in a soil, that BT, that's a clay layer. And usually water will sink down to it and be perched above it. And the majority of water that gets to our creek flows along that subsurface boundary. Um, we still do have some surface flow. But really, if you look at this, that's what we see a lot of the time. Highly variable, right? I mean, it's very different. We're going to see that in the field. Justin and, and Drew and others will hit upon this. But just keep that in mind. 
So when and how does our management change this? When does it drive more water to the surface that can contribute to, to erosion? That's probably one of the places that we want to start to take action in, in reverse. Yes? Do gophers uh, help this process of water getting into the soils, or is it? Yeah, why are they mentioned here? Yeah, gophers. So that's good. Why are they mentioned? Um, a couple things going on as well. Part of the reason this is happening is because of that clay layer I described. There's also what's known as, I'm going to use a term called macro pore flow, big, big pores. And I, I share you that size because the gopher hole, a decomposing oak root, they create pipes. So a lot of water can move that way as well. Sometimes we get to subsurface erosion and that opens up the landscape and creates a problem. Is that a management problem? Is that a process that would normally go on anyway? Erosion happens? We'll have to talk about that. But that's the other reason that a lot of this water is flowing subsurface is there's these macro pores. And you've seen it. You've probably seen it where you've been out on, in the middle of a storm. If you like to do that kind of thing, chase storms, I do. Um, you've seen that water coming up out of the ground, right? Yeah, I got one at 100 feet long. Yeah. Yeah, I, I traced it in and I was able to walk it off. Yeah. And, and it will. It can do subsurface erosion and then it opens I got, up. I got a lot of, I noticed a lot of the muddy water is coming out of those rubber holes. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's, not, it's not off the surface and it's not off of anything anybody's done except the gopher. So, or the mole. So start to envision soil's getting wet, it's getting saturated, it's, it's coming down to this clay layer and it's perching, right? It's building up in there. Those holes are in there. As that water gets, as that soil gets uh, saturated, it starts to release water into that hole, into that long tunnel, and that's what you're seeing happen. Yeah, it's not that there. water came into it from the top, it's that this sponge is so wet that it's releasing water into the gopher hole. This was about, started about that far below the surface where I saw it, yeah. and then I followed where it was going, and it went up and found up where it was coming up. Yeah. And I've seen, yeah, I've seen someone. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, soils are so important that I wanted to visit about a couple resources for you. And, um, and I think Drew and Justin, and we'll hit upon it in the field. There's, um, and Drew's, Drew's organization, the natural and, and agencies got, the, got some resources as well. But this website, if you just Google cow soil resource, you can access both um, Google Earth soil tools as well as foam tools um, to find your soil, where you're at, and where you're interested. Um, I happened to, to load my phone today and pulled up, and I'll show you what, what, the, what it looks like here for you locally. Um, but you can start to get, you know, here's the example of the Google Earth version. So if you're sitting at your computer and you're online, um, here's what the the smartphone app looks like both for Android and for, for Apple phones. Um, and this is what it kind of looks like as you drill down in and you can think about where we're at and when we drill. Um, and just real quick, this is the, is that focus? I, I took my glasses off, that's why it's not focused. Um, <laughs> the gilding soil, very shallow soil, right? About 10 centimeters. If you guys know that, you are out here working it. That, that soil doesn't have a lot of ability to store a lot of water. Um, it's going to probably create a lot of subsurface slope pretty quickly, and it's going to create surface flow. Not, not anything you don't know, but this is all from either the online soil web or the phone, and I can show you with the, that here in a little bit. You'll learn more about the soils in here, and one of the things you'll learn about is what's called the erodibility. Now, this, this little fact sheet was written for a lake in Mendocino counties, and it was written for agricultural producers, but it, it, the principles really apply. They apply across these oak woodlands. So um, inside these resources, you can learn about what's called the erodibility of soils. So that's kind of, I'm getting to my last point here. So we've talked about climate and weather, the geology, the, the, the position of the landscape. Um, we talked about soils, and now we just start to sit, put it all together. So out in our streams, We've got some surface flow. We've got the start of, an, of, of a headwater stream made with a little bit of fine sediment in it. Um, down in our streams, we've got different size sediment, the gravels, um, moving and being moved and being stored. Um, 
This is a picture, not unlike Monin's Rill going down into Mark West. This is a, a tributary stream that flows into the Garcia River. So just that's happening. That kind of small gravel into softball size into boulder size. It's moving through the watershed all the time. Uh, and that's, that's important. Um, and, and how much is moving and where is different across the state. This is a map of sediment yield. You remember I, I talked to you about that? Kind of calculated on an annual basis. The highest amount of sediment is generally moving where it's mostly wet, um, or maybe where there's not as much vegetation to prevent it from moving. Um, where you're more forested or maybe not as steeply sloped, you have less sediment being moved across the landscape on an annual basis. But again, it's important. It plays a really critical, that sediment out in the streams plays a critical habitat role for coho, for steelhead, um, for macro invertebrates, for small insects and bugs and others. So that's why we care about it. We want that sediment to be generated. We want the right kind of sediment to be generated. And we want to avoid any extra being generated from our management or sediment that's really fine that might impact what these gravels, the habitat management they provide. And I think we're going to, some of the other speakers will get into that more. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about fire. And of course, fire is something we either manage away from or use actively. This is a prescribed burn, so I just want you to appreciate how quickly when you do a low temperature type of burn uh, in the middle of summer, um, and how quickly it can recover. So this was in June of 2003. Across, It was a mixed oak woodland, not unlike this, but it was done at a time when you could burn and not risk the, the large vegetation catching fire. And as you move through the year, this is December, that, that next set of winter rains comes on. On the left there is the, is, this is where it was burned. I'll back up. So I just try to keep the same orientation, burn, the, uh, the fire break between it and unburned. So again, this area was burned, here was the fire break, and this area was not burned. And then this is what it looked like post the winter. So in one winter, with a low temperature, kind of low to the ground grass burn, you get pretty quick recovery. Um, of course, where and when fires like we experienced through Cobb Mountain, Talk, I heard some folks talking about the Valley Fire earlier today. Um, that creates landscapes that's just ready for erosion. Um, that interception won't be happening anymore. Um, lots of rain gets to hit open bare ground, and we're at risk to lots of erosion. So that's that's how fire can play a role. And I just I'll wrap up with just some different kinds of erosion sites, and, and I know Justin's going to really help us with this, but. We have some of these big goals, uh, gullies that, that uh, open up from time to time. Uh, anecdotally, 1983, 385 was a big period of this kind of erosion happening. But they're out there, and, and they might happen for these gopher hole reasons. Uh, they have typically happen where we have kind of a bowl in the landscape. Um, and sometimes we can do things about them, and sometimes they're so big uh, they get away from us. They also might be geologically derived because we're on really soft kinds of geology. Uh, so just think about that. Uh, but we also have stream bank erosion and sometimes we want to work on those kinds of projects uh, for different reasons. We might be trying to protect property. Uh, it might be having an impact to habitat. But here's a picture of a shotgun culvert. I know we're going to get into that more. So types of erosion that can happen from our roads and our road management. So you want to be thinking about that. And uh, one other paper I'll pass around just because it, it emphasizes this point is we did a survey across Northern California ranches um, about these types of erosion sites. And when you get down to what we can really manage, it's, it's roads. But that's really in our strength. It's also where our man management is probably contributing the most fine sediment to the creek. Um, and so that's where we should you know, likely spend a lot of our time but keep in mind other objectives for in-stream habitat. Um, so I won't go back over this, but it's a place just for you to pause and think about that as we walk around today, the, the hydrologic cycle and the things I've talked about. And if you're more pictorial like me and just like, like to think about it in terms of colors in the landscape, um, hopefully you think about your watershed a little differently from summer to winter and spring.
And I'll say thank you. Any other questions? Hopefully that help. Okay, left to speechless. <laughs> So um, generally when you see erosion, 
it's concentrated water that causes it. And getting back to what Dave was talking about, the very first concentration of water is, I'm definitely not a scientist at all, but you know, in the clouds you have water vapor and mist and eventually it turns into rain. And the first time you see erosion is when that water vapor forms a raindrop and it falls towards the ground in a concentrated form and smashes onto the ground. And if it hits a leaf or it hits a blade of grass, that's great because it deconcentrates that water and it takes that energy away. But if it hits bare soil or a road, it, I mean, it's on a tiny, tiny little scale that you really can't see, but it smashes hard and any loose soil there gets knocked away and gets entrained in that water and moves away from where it was. So that's sort of the very basic um, start of erosion. So that's where you really need to think about um, the first part of deconcentrating water. But what I'd like to do, obviously you guys are all here because you're concerned about erosion. Does anybody want to volunteer some of the erosion that, on their property that they're seeing? Maybe we can talk about that specifically. Anybody? Yeah? Sure. Um, I've got a six and a half acre piece of land in Occidental. And my next door neighbors have four horses that they keep on a plot of land about probably no more than 150 feet by 150 feet. So you can imagine what it looks like this time of year and smells like. And um, they're self proclaimed hillbillies. Oh, great. <laughs> um, they don't want me to, you know, get involved in their land at all. But um, what happens is all the water from their land comes shuttling down their land through the horse manure and then ends up taking a left turn right at the very end, just before it enters my land. Okay. And so it stops up Coleman Creek. It delivers manure filled sedimentation water to the salmon. Um, I have to go out there and clean it up because they say it's your pipes. And um, last year the AT&T truck backed into it and had to get towed out. And so the city brought out um, what you were talking about before, just solving the problem mm -hmm. rather than the real issue. Right. And put these enormously huge boulders in this ditch and it looks like hell. Right. So. Um, Brooke actually came out to my property a couple times. I think you worked with her. Yeah, she yeah. works for the NRCS. Yeah, and she told me about your program and that I might be able to get funding. She estimated it would cost $10,000 and it would have to be done with both neighbors involved. Yeah, once you get neighbors involved, that gets things <laughs> very complicated. But that's a it's an excellent example of erosion being caused by lack of vegetation. That soil hits the hits the ground hard and entrains all that manure and all that soil. Now, the way you describe the water concentrating and taking a left turn on your property, that may be due to, um, you know, I haven't seen it. It may be gravity. Due, <laughs> 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 